many people died. We've been working with the newspaper, and you will see that with some astonishing computer renditions, we've come to realize that very often that's the difference between living and dying. I might add that some of those who survived have been very generous with their time so that we could understand. I was uh, on the phone talking to one of my colleagues in another office, heard a loud roar, and I had to turn 90 degrees to look out the window to look north, and right there coming right at me was this uh, large passenger jet, maybe just two or three plane lengths away from me. And I just stuck my head and prayed to God to save me, because I thought uh, this was it. Eight floors below George Slay, Fred Eichler was standing at his window. He saw it, too. I mean, we were staring into the cockpit. We could not recognize anything. I mean, it did happen kind of quickly, but we saw the entire plane and then watched it crash into the building. Got out of the elevator. I heard a whoosh, and I looked up. And the three elevators directly across from me were uh, on fire. I, they were just, they just had exploded, and the doors on the elevators were ajar. Uh, I immediately decided I just have to go where I don't see flames. I ran out of the elevator into the first office I could find. It was an insurance company called Axelera. A gentleman there named Fred Eichler uh, uh, told me that he had actually just seen an American Airlines jet fly into the building while he was sitting, uh, having his breakfast. Strangers thrown together in terrible circumstances. They would need each other to survive. The hallway burst into flames outside of our door, so we were trapped in our office, and we could not get out. We believed that people knew we were up there, but... Um, I'm not quite sure if anybody really, really did know. On an express elevator, Chris Young was alone, headed for the North Tower lobby. I was in sort of a good mood, and so I started sort of just like uh, jumping up in the elevator to see if I could get that, you know, lighter than air feeling or whatever when the elevator's speeding down. It was just at that point that there was just a huge, massive shaking uh, of the elevator that made it screech to a stop. And it, it was quickly followed by this just huge uh, gust of wind um, that pushed into the elevator and uh, sort of pushed in all this fine yellow dust uh, into the elevator. Um, and I mean, you know, as, ras as rational as it was or whatever, you know, I had been jumping in the elevator. It was like, you know, oh my God, I've, you know, I've done something. 91 floors above, George Slay struggled to recover after the plane hit a few feet over his head. And everything came down around me. My ceiling tiles all collapsed around me. The light fixtures came down. All the books on my bookshelf uh, tumbled on top of me. So um, I didn't really feel the impact. I was distracted by all of this and we got out of our office space into the hallway. There was some smoke on the floor, but we headed to the third stairway. We looked up and there was debris in the stairwell above us. There was some debris in the form of sheetrock on the stairs. We just lifted that against the wall and we were able to, to walk down the stairs from that point. There was no one coming down when we entered into the stairwell. And no one ever would. The 92nd floor would become the bottom of the North Tower tomb. The upper floors were sealed off. The plane's impact had collapsed all three escape stairwells. Elevator shafts were destroyed or had become infernos. Rescue would prove impossible. Those people trapped in the upper 19 floors would not survive. The South Tower was 125 feet from the north, and on the 105th floor, a large meeting had assembled in the offices of Aon Insurance. Joe Dittmar was at the meeting. The lights flickered. A gentleman came into the, 
into the room and, and said that there had been an explosion in the, in, uh, the first tower and that we had to leave um, because we were being evacuated. Throughout the South Tower, the alarm spread and evacuation began. Most of the people had little idea of what had happened to the North Tower or how severe the damage was. People on the 105th floor began down through the stairwell, and on the 90th floor, they noticed a door open. They filed out of the stairwell. We, we went out onto the 90th floor. I don't even know whose offices were there, and that's when we first... That's when we first had the chance to experience what was going on. Worst 30 seconds of my life. The first thing that I noticed was screaming. Uh, a man, a very distinct voice of a man screaming, oh my God, oh my God. And uh, oh, a woman just shrieking. So obviously I had to look, I looked out. You could see that the, the, the first tower was engulfed in flames. There was a gaping hole in the building. And then things just coming out of the building, just falling out of the building. Uh, the furniture and the papers and the people person just wandered to the side of the building, obviously choking and blind from the smoke. And since the floor had been blown away, was jagged, probably didn't realize where the end of the floor was and just fell right out of the building. And as you stand there at the window, you just watch this body drop. And your stomach and your knees drop right along with that. And then another, and then another. That just scared the daylight out of me. I just immediately started um, telling people, you need to leave. Whatever it is, we'll find out when we're downstairs. Florence Jones worked for Baseline Financial with offices on the 77th and 78th floors of the South Tower, connected by an escalator. She remembers pleading with Jill Campbell, a receptionist on the 78th floor, to leave. I could tell she was scared. And I just kept saying, get in an elevator, get in an elevator. She wasn't going to leave until someone more superior in charge told her to leave. And she didn't do that until the chief financial officer said to her, look, if you want to leave, go ahead and leave. The last I saw of her, she went out to go wait for an elevator to go down. If the boss stayed, the staff stayed. Today, your fate was sealed if you stayed too long. In the South Tower, workers from most floors were heading down through the three emergency stairwells and using the building's 99 elevators. Thousands of people went steadily out of the building. But in the North Tower, the conditions were getting steadily worse. Fred Eichler and Jonathan Judd were still trapped in offices on the 83rd floor. I don't know if it was metal or glass, but you could see glittering things coming down, big crashes. You could hear big crashes, and everyone said, stay away from the windows. Um, you could see tons and tons of papers flying, like a, like a ticker tape parade. Um, and it, it continued to get smokier and smokier. My wife, my parents, and one of my daughters called. And I never told them what the real situation was. I never told them that there was an inferno right outside our door. But realistically, I really believe that was the last time I'm going to speak to them. Somewhere near the North Tower lobby, Chris Young's elevator was still stuck. Young, alone, was desperately pushing emergency buttons. This computer voice came on, uh, saying that your call had been received, uh, that someone would be there to, that someone would be with you shortly. And it just kept repeating that message over and over, and you couldn't, there was no way to make it stop. It was, it was about 15 minutes or so, and then someone did come on to the intercom, a live person. And the first thing they said, is anybody in here? I just sort of yelled out, yes. I asked him what, what had happened, um, but he really wouldn't give me any specifics. He just said, you know, it's an emergency situation um, and that someone would, would be there shortly to get me out of the elevator. The mortal peril of those trapped in the North Tower's upper floors was becoming increasingly clear. Desperate for air, windows were broken people clung to the side of the building a hundred stories up. Workers in the South Tower looked at them from just feet away. To see these 
young people doing the sign of the cross and, and jumping, you were like, oh my God, it's got to be awful up there for people to make that choice to want to jump and know that you're going to die. And you can't pull your eyes away as much as you'd like to, just out of sheer dignity for them, you'd like to, but it's very hard to do that. I kept saying to myself, this is not a movie. This is real. These are real human beings that are smashing. It's just, uh, that's an awful thing to, to see. Florence Jones had gone to the 78th floor elevators, but they were now packed. And I was like, you know, we're not getting out this way. We have to go downstairs, make sure everyone is off the floor, and uh, we gotta leave. And that's the only reason why I'm here today is because I ran down the escalator with them to make sure everybody was off the 77th floor. On this day, the smallest decision would be crucial. Seven floors above on the 84th floor of the South Tower, a similar scene was playing out. Brian Clark worked for a Eurobank. One woman in particular, Susan Polio, did not know she was about to see what she saw. And as she looked up, all of a sudden she spun in horror and ran back to me the five yards back from the glass I was. And Brian, Brian, she said, it's, people are dying, she said. And I said, Susan, I know it's a, it's a terrible thing. And I put my arms around her. I said, come on, let's get you composed. And I, and I walked her off our trading floor down the center hallway to the west side of the building, which is where the ladies' room is. And I said, you know, get, your, get yourself together. And it really is that walk, I think, that uh, saved my life. Throughout the South Tower, people were going down through the stairwells or using the elevators. And then, just before 9 a.m., there was an announcement broadcast throughout the building. The statement was, it appears that Trade Center 2 is now safe. You can go back to your offices. And at which point, um, a lot of people stopped dead in the stairwell. Actually saw people going back in the other direction, people going back to their places of work. They were, you know, hey, going back. I, I remember clearly saying, well, where are you going? And he said, I'm going back to work. I said, God, you're more dedicated than I could ever hope to be. 78 is a sky lobby. There's express elevators that go from 78 to 1. So me and five of my friends decided, you know, okay, let's walk up a couple of flights. Why walk down? It was really hot, so we walked up back to 78, figuring on catching an elevator. The 78th floor sky lobby had a bank of 12 express elevators and 24 local elevators to the upper floors. The lobby had become packed with people, some heading out of the building, some back to their offices. That's where I saw Mary, and she said, you know, in words that I shouldn't use here, um, that there was no conceivable way she was going to walk down 90 more flights of stairs or 78 more flights of stairs. She was taking the elevator. The elevators were running. Come on. And um, just had a, again, a, 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 a gut feeling. I can never really explain it 100%. Something that just told me, no, keep walking. Whether to use the stairs or wait for an elevator, another fateful decision. One floor below, Florence Jones looked south from the 77th floor windows. I could see straight across the floor, which was all glass. And I could not figure out on a bright, sunny, cloudless day what this black thing was that was approaching the building. Four floors above, Stanley Primnath saw the same thing. And for no apparent reason, I just raised my head, watching towards the harbor, the Statue of Liberty, and what I saw was a giant aircraft come in eye contact, eye level towards me. And I dove under my deck. This impact was so great that I got temporarily deaf. Couldn't hear anything. It looks like a demolition crew came in and just knocked everything flat. Steel doors were knocked off. All the walls were flattened. 
All the desks and every piece of furniture was damaged. All the computers were like smithereens. The ceiling caved in and part of the 82nd floor collapsed. And I'm hiding under a steel desk, the only one that stood intact. My Bible was on top of that desk. Stanley Primnath had survived the direct hit. The nose of the plane had come right through the windows of his floor. And the bottom wing is hung in my office door 20 feet from where I am. And the wing starts to burn. I couldn't see the rest of the plane. And I'm saying to myself, oh Lord, this plane is going to explode and I'm going to die. I have to get out of here as fast as possible. Three floors above Stanley on the 84th floor, Brian Clark's decision to walk a colleague to the bathroom had taken him out of the plane's path. Nearly 50 people died on the east side of the floor. On the west, there was a handful of survivors. Brian Clark and Ron DeFrancesca were two of them. I got knocked flying. And, you know, the false ceilings all came down and debris and dust and all the lights went out. And it was louder than you could imagine. And for the next 10 seconds, I experienced terror. And the building swayed. The building just went, went, went a long way. It seemed like for 10 seconds, one way. This felt like it was going yards. And I thought we were going over. I thought we were falling to the west into the Hudson. Um, but it stopped and didn't move and then came back to vertical. My colleague and I, we just, he was screaming and I grabbed him and I led this man into the stairwell with me. And um, we proceeded on our journey. Now the people in the North Tower stared at the South Tower to see the horror that mirrored their own. Jonathan Judd was on the phone to his wife, who saw the plane hit on television. And as I was speaking to her, she said, oh my god, look out the window. And the, uh, the other plane had hit the South Tower, and all I saw was flame. My entire field of vision was flame. It was like hell. That's when I really, really got scared. And my legs started to shake like I've never felt them before, like, almost like I couldn't stand up. We heard this massive explosion, and we thought that the floors above us were collapsing on us. At that point, we made a decision to try to get out. As we got to maybe five, ten feet to where we thought we were going, all the lights went out, and we could not see anything. So we decided to go back to our office, and there wasn't a word that was, that was spoken. It was dead silent. And the only noise you heard was the ceiling tile falling all around you. Neither be rescued or die. Those were the choices. Such choices. Joe Dittmar chose not to take an elevator and walk down the stairs. Brian Clark chose to help a distressed colleague to the bathroom, away from the windows, and a floor that exploded on impact. Florence Jones chose to go down a floor to 77 to organize the evacuation of her offices. All of them survived. For me, that decision was crucial because everybody practically on that floor died on 78. And where I would have been standing, there would have been no way, no way I could have gotten out of the way of that airplane. The United plane had devastated the South Tower from the 78th through the 84th floors. Hundreds of people had been standing in the 78th floor sky lobby waiting for elevators. Only 10 of them are known to have survived. They were standing at the far north end of the lobby, very near the only stairwell that had not been destroyed. Mary Jost was there. So were Kelly Ryer and Donna Sfera. There was like six of us. And I says, are you, uh, uh, is anybody going up? And my friend just turned around and said, I'm not going back up. 
soon as she said that, the plane hit. As I woke up, I turned, and I saw fire, and my face felt like it went on fire. And then I turned, and I felt like my back was on fire, and I rolled. But I couldn't roll far, because there were people around me. And I remember just walking into the elevator, and then just feeling a blast, like nothing I'd ever felt before, just a wave of heat. Um, and just, I was smashed into the back wall of the elevator um, and just crumpled to the floor. When I regained my senses, there was a inferno in the elevator shaft that was coming into the elevator. The fire was coming in, the hot embers were flying into the elevator, and it was filling up with black smoke. I realized then what the people in Trade Center 1, the choice they were making, which was, you'll do anything but burn to me. It's the most horrifying experience that I've ever faced in my life. And I remember thinking, well, if I can stand up long enough to breathe in the hot smoke, I'll die of smoke asphyxiation, and I won't know that I'm going to burn to death trapped in this elevator. I remember seeing my friend laying on the floor. My pocketbook had fallen on her. She wasn't conscious. None of my friends that I was with on 78 made it. I just couldn't see. It was so dark. I just couldn't see anybody. I couldn't help anybody because I was hurt. I knew there was a stairwell, and I crawled until I was blocked by the elevator banks. And I stood up, and fortunately, the door opened to touch. And the lights were on in the stairwell. So I basically yelled back that if anybody could hear me, as far as I, I knew, there was nobody alive. And nothing, heard nothing back. And I proceeded to go down. I then, I guess, started to look around and realized that the doors hadn't closed all the way and that maybe I could get out of the elevator. And I start pulling, but the fire is coming up from the floor, and it's singeing my arms every time I'm trying to do this. And as I open the door and I look forward, what I saw was the whole floor was on fire. The people that were in the sky lobby, most of them appeared to have been killed instantly. Uh, there were some people who seemed to be alive. Um, those that were alive, as we're crawling along, as I'm crawling along, you're touching each body to see if the person's alive or not alive. And that's when I met up with uh, Kelly. It was, that was a miracle because there wasn't many people that made it on that floor. The first thing I said to her was, I guess God wants us to live. Because there's no other explanation for why we were alive that I could see from what we walked through. I just held on to Kelly for dear life. I held on to his belt buckle. And we just started going down the stairs. And there wasn't many people going down the stairs. Kelly and Donna, who was badly wounded, were on their way down out of the smoke and the flames. Just below, Mary Jose was about to fall into the arms of a stranger, Eric Thompson, who was looking up the shattered stairwell. All I could see was blackness behind her. Um, the door looked like it was wedged open. The pipes were down. There was water running. The ventilation had fallen. Uh, the sheetrock was, was laying crumbled. There was soot on everything. I just heard someone before. I heard her before I saw her, and she's like, is anyone down there? Can you please come and help me? I'm hurt. I don't think I really ever knew how badly I was hurt at all. Um, I didn't know I had a blow to the head. I mean, I, I just, I didn't know that part of my arm was gone, you know. I didn't. I had no idea. And I, I guess it's, part of it is, is uh, your systems just take over. Adrenaline just keeps pumping and you just go. On this day, strangers rescued strangers. In the South Tower, on the highest floors, only 17 people are known to have made it safely out of the building. Virtually no one made it unassisted. There would be no emergency help from below. We, we entered the stairs on the 84th floor, stairway A, and only went down three floors when we met a woman 
and a smaller man, but a very heavy set woman coming up. And she was insistent, stop, stop. You can't go down. We've just, we referring to her associate, we've just come off a floor in flames and we've got to go higher, get above the smoke. You can't, and she just wouldn't stop talking and said, no, you got to go up. And very quickly, 15, 20 seconds into that conversa conversation, the d or the debate, if you like, I was distracted. And I heard this banging on the wall and a voice yelling in the darkness on the 81st floor, help, help, I'm buried, I can't breathe, is anybody there, help? And I was able to push the drywall back and get onto the 81st floor. Just feet away, Stanley Premnath, who survived the plane's impact under his desk, was still alive. But he was trapped behind the burning and collapsed walls of his former office. And I started to crawl. And I'm saying, don't leave me to die. This is Stan from the loans department. Please, help me, somebody. But I could see through this opening. I said, now, you must jump. You've got to jump over this. That's the only way out. He just grabbed me around the shoulder and the neck, and he just pulled everything he got and yanked me through that wall. And with an impact, I just fell on top of him. And I hugged that man. I gave him the biggest kiss, and I said, you are my guardian angel. And he gave me the biggest hug imaginable. And to break the clench, more or less, I, I said, uh, I'm Brian. He said, I'm Stanley. You know, we're going to be brothers for life. Back in the stairwell, all the other survivors had decided to go up, including Ron DiFrancesco. Down was the fire, right? So we started climbing and climbing and, um, you know, looking for a way out, but all the doors seemed to be locked. To go up or go down, Stanley and Brian had the same decision to make. And we looked at each other, and I just, I just instinctively went down. It was in my mind that, regardless of what that lady had said, that I needed to test what was below. I would go down, and if we were stopped by something, we were stopped. But, but if not, we'd just keep going. 66 floors below, Joe Dittmar was close to the safety of the streets. There was a guy, a security guy, around the 15th floor, and he was singing. I don't even remember what he was singing, but he was in the middle of singing, and then he'd stop and he'd say, you're going to remember this day for the rest of your life. Be proud to be an American. You're going to remember this day for the rest of your life. No one would know, of course, that time was short and the towers were about to fall. And as we've seen, complete strangers were thrown together in the most desperate of circumstances. They would help each other survive. When we come back, they survived the plane's impact. But how would they survive the unthinkable, the collapse of the towers? I just thought that, we, you know, that this was going to be a tomb. Um, I pray, please God, make it quick. ABC's coverage of 9-11 will continue in a moment. They were American heroes fighting the war against terror. But did they bring terror home? Four soldiers accused of killing their wives. Friday, what you don't know about the Fort Bragg murders. John Miller investigates on the season premiere of 2020, Friday. George Stephanopoulos. He's never done anything just the same old way. And Sunday mornings will be no exception. Starting this Sunday, it's a new This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Sundays, this is where news will be made. We come from all walks of life. We come from diverse backgrounds. We are seeking opportunities. We are seeking to make a difference. Making a difference in our family's future, in our community's well-being, and in our country's freedom. We are America's future. We are members of the Air National Guard.
Hey, right now, I just wanted to encourage you. The situation you're going through is something God definitely can handle. He wants to help you. He loves you. Open up to him today because he really cares. Receive Jesus. For an accurate weather forecast, one live Doppler radar is good, but two live radars, twice as good. For the first time on U.S. television, cutting-edge forecasting technology, the most accurate live radar system ever. Coming soon only on ABC7. ABC News 9-11 continues once again, Peter Jennings. Welcome back. In the next half hour, we're going to continue our moment-by-moment -moment reconstruction, which we did with USA Today, of what happened inside the Twin Towers in the final moments before the buildings fell. The fires in the highest floors were out of control. Rescue to those floors was impossible. No skyscraper had ever collapsed because of fire, no matter how severe. So how could anyone expect it now? In the South Tower's 78th floor sky lobby, those survivors nearest the stairwell who could walk were now heading down. But many more people lay there in shock and in need of help, including Ling Young. We can't find the stairs. We're afraid to move because I don't know how safe the floor is. So we decided, you know what, we're just going to sit around. We're going to wait for help. And that probably is a good 10, 15 minutes. Into this desperate place, another stranger arrived, wearing a red bandana. There's a man who came up out of, out of nowhere and said, Hey, I found the stairs. Follow me. So we walked down about maybe, I don't know, maybe like 10 or, 10 or 15 floors. Then I really turned around. I saw him carrying another woman in his back. He dropped the woman down, and he said, You know, you got to walk because I'm going back upstairs. And that's the last time I saw him. There was just this guy, and I don't know who the guy is, that was just in the doorway. And all you heard him say was, over here. The door was open and you could see a light. Over and over, there are reports of one man systematically pulling people to their feet and heading them down the stairs. The man in the red bandana, that would be Wells. That would be the way he would react. Wells Crowther. A securities trader on the 104th floor. He had been a volunteer firefighter since he was 16. He always carried a red bandana in his back pocket, like his father. When Wells' parents heard the stories, they knew. When I heard the man in the red bandana, I, it went straight to my heart, and I just knew inside. Stepping in out of nowhere and, and rushing and calling for a fire extinguisher and carrying a victim down to clear air, it just... I just knew it was our son. In the months afterward, a photograph was circulated among the 78th floor survivors. At least two people identified him. His face is always in my mind. A young kid, short hair, husky. When I saw that picture, I said, that's it. In the last hour of his life, Wells Remy Crowther, he was a firefighter, which is what he wanted truly to be doing. Months later, Wells Crowther's body was found in the remains of the South Tower lobby with a group of lost firemen. The stairwells above the floors where the plane hit were now thick with smoke and virtually impassable. Ron DeFrancesco, who had climbed up seeking clear air, was now desperately climbing down. On the 78th floor, in the one stairwell that had not been destroyed, he laid down gasping for air. Somebody lifted me out of there. I got up and, um, you know, felt my way towards the stairwell. And at that point, I saw all the drywall down there was on fire. And once I ran past that, the stairwell was clear. I was by myself. Though no one could know, the Twin Towers were both perilously close to collapse. For those still in the buildings, time was short. On the 83rd floor of the North Tower, a group including Jonathan Judd and Fred Eichler was still trapped in the office. I don't think we could 
could have survived another five or ten minutes in our office. That's how bad the smoke was getting. I just did not figure we were going to get out. Um, and I, we were just prepared to die, you know, in, in the office. I mean, that, that's what was going through our heads. I was sitting on a chair, and I was facing the door, and about 9.30, I spotted this flashlight. And you could see the beams of light going through the door, and it was like a godsend. And it turned out to be a fireman and a, a building worker. I jumped up, signaled them, and they did come in, and basically rescued us. Saved by rescue workers who reached the 83rd floor of the North Tower. Saved by the glass office doors that let them see the flashlight. Just down the hall, a group of 13 people were trapped inside the offices of General Telecom. The front doors were wood. They couldn't see the flashlight. They were not discovered. All would perish. 83 floors below, Chris Young, still stuck in his elevator, is desperately trying to pry open the doors. They will not budge. He still has no idea what is going on. I sat back down uh, on the floor. I started just humming to myself. I, just, I mean, it did get very boring in there, and I would, I, you know, sit there and while well, I start, I would start running through, you know, scenarios of what might have happened or whatever, and I could vaguely hear uh, it, not very well, but um, outside the elevator, I, I could vaguely hear, you know, sirens. Um, I heard occasional screams um, that I could never, you know, make out voices or anything or hear people talking. Those people who would survive were moving quickly now down to the streets. And strangers encouraged strangers, assisting the wounded, comforting those in shock. And I think we sort of uh, uh, got through it by just kind of calling out four by four. You know, okay, we're at 66. Okay, we're at 65. You know, only 63 more to go. You know, 50. See how many we made. Floor 20. <laughs> I just remembered it was the 20th floor, and I just said, I can't do this anymore because I was hurting so bad, and I stopped. Her arms were severely burned. Her face appeared to be burned. She was limping. Both her wrists looked to be broken. And Kelly just said, come on. He said, you, we did all these flights. You got 20 more. And we just, I says, okay. And we just did it. I knew I was growing tired at times. And Eric would, Eric would tell me, you know, he said, why don't you just sit down? And I think I'd sit down, and I'd go, no, we have to go. Because there was just something in, inside of me that kept saying, we have to get out of here. As we were going down the stairs, um, I mean, I, I remember I had tears in my eyes, and uh, Fred Eichler was putting his arm around me, trying to calm me down, and he's saying, you know, what's wrong? Uh, are you okay? He really thought, you know, he was never going to, you know, see his baby again. And, I know going down the steps, I, many times I put my arm around them and I said, we're going to make it, you know, we're going to be okay. The people who were going down stayed to the left and the firemen were on the right side of the stairwell coming up. Uh, and that's, that is a very haunting memory, seeing all those firemen going up the staircases who we were going down, knowing that probably they did not survive. There was a look of both determination and fear in their faces that I'll never forget. I see it every day. I think about it every day. You know, we definitely wished them Godspeed. And, but that was like down in the 30s. And they were huffing and puffing in. And I'm like, you know, we're near where you need to be. And he says, be happy you're going down instead of coming up. Firefighters would finally reach the 78th floor of the South Tower in time to find people trapped and alive, but too late to get them out. On street level, people from some of the highest and most devastated floors were finally out of the building and into the arms of waiting rescue workers. I remember as people see us coming, I guess because of the way we looked, you know, Donna, you know, bleeding, um, 
I have, you know, clothes are shredded and blood and, and debris all through our hairs and on our feet. They just part like the Red Sea to let us through. So when I came out of the building, I, I think I was just collapsing at that point. And I remember Dominic carrying me and um, telling me it's going to be okay. And I just said, don't worry about it. You're out now. I've got you. I said, if, you, if it hurts, just squeeze me. Um, and she held tighter. And um, I said, you'll see your family today. Don't worry about it. You're out. You're going to see your family. You'll go home. You'll be okay. I don't even remember who took me. I just remember it being someone uniformed. Mary Jose was immediately put on a stretcher, but not without saying goodbye to Eric Thompson. And I remember giving him a hug and telling him, thank you for saving my life. Hang in there, lady. <laughs> Ling Young made it out to the curb, escorted by a fireman from the 51st floor down. All the wounded were quickly loaded into ambulances. Stanley Primnath and Brian Clark stared back at the burning buildings. And he looked through the trees and he said, you know, Brian, he said, I think that tower could come down. And Brian had this look in his eyes. Stan, I told you steel don't bend. I'm an engineer. And we heard this train sound. It was like steel bending and creaking. It was like a horrible, ghostly sound. And this building started to sway from side to side. And I didn't finish the sentence, and we watched the tower start to slide down into its own dust. As the South Tower began to fall, Ron DeFrancesco was just reaching the exit. He is one of the last people to make it out alive. I looked out to Liberty Street and saw a big fireball coming. That's all I remember. Ron DeFrancesco was blown across the street. He regained consciousness days later in a hospital. He had a fractured skull and burns over 67% of his body. Inside the North Tower, Fire Chief Rich Picciotto had worked his way up to the 35th floor when the South Tower went down. All of a sudden, this noise starts. This horrendous, powerful noise. Kind of just freezes everyone in, in their tracks, and we're just looking up because it's coming from above us. You know, what is that? The building is shaking. We're looking up. We're all just looking at the ceiling. Then I'm just waiting for the ceiling to explode. And then the noise kind of just goes through us. And then the noise just blows, and then it stops. Utter silence. George Slay had just come down all the way from the North Tower's 91st floor. All the lights went out and um, I was blown across the concourse. Just the force of what I imagined a tornado would be. I was able to stay on my feet and uh, was enveloped in a huge cloud of dust. And um, I thought my life was over at that point. And um, again, I just prayed to God to spare me and uh, in his mercy, he did. Within the space of a hundred minutes, George Slay had survived the crash of a plane just 20 feet over his head and now the collapse of a skyscraper at his feet. Chris Young was still in his North Tower elevator. He did not know what had just happened, but he had heard it. First, it started just uh, as a rumble. I just, I could sort of feel it shaking into the elevator. It made the elevator just increasingly shake and shake and shake. And then it was, it was followed by this gust of wind that started just pressing in just these massive amounts of dust and through the side cracks uh, of the doors and at that point I, I mean i did just just sort of ball up totally on the floor um, with the shirt uh, around my head because um, I, I didn't know what was going on 
When the South Tower collapsed, the fire department ordered the evacuation of all rescue personnel from the North Tower. I took the bullhorn and I went to all three stairwells and, just, and yelled up and down, we're evacuating, we're getting out. This is the fire department, we're getting out. Finally, the power just goes out. There was no particular event uh, that preceded it, but just the power goes out in the elevator. It uh, goes dark for a second and then emergency lights do come on. For one last time, Chris Young goes to the elevator doors and tries to pry them apart. And suddenly they open to the lobby of the North Tower. It was uh, uh, just, uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't know what to make of it at the time, but just a very surreal scene with everything uh, of the lobby, just completely debris strewn and uh, just inches of this uh, sort of grayish, pinkish dust uh, was everywhere, all over the place. And there was no one in the lobby. Um, but then outside the building, I saw two firefighters. And I just yelled out to them, you know, uh, where do I go? Um, and one of them turned back and looked at me and uh, just sort of motioned me over with his hand. And then I took a look up the tower, uh, and all I could see was, you know, the smoke coming from, from the upper floors and fire shooting out. And I just let out, oh, my God. Um, but the firefighters just sort of jerked me then and said, come on, we got to go. Just as Chris Young got out of the building, the North Tower began to collapse. The fire chief, Rich Picciotto, was still on the sixth floor. All of a sudden, that noise starts again. That horrendous noise from the last time, this noise, now it's intensified a hundred times. The building is shaking like crazy now. You, you just knew it was going to be on you in a matter of seconds, and it was. I you know, tried to run down the stairs and fell down and tried to get up and fell again, tumbled, and, and then, I, then I had this falling sensation. And then, a couple seconds later, deathly silence again. Black, silent black, and I'm covered with dust, debris, but I realized I was alive. So I just called out, is, is there anyone else here? And I started hearing, yeah, I'm here. I'm here too. You know, from both above me and below me. In the rubble of the North Tower, part of one stairwell had remained intact. 14 people, 12 of them firemen, had survived there. But they were trapped, including Captain Jay Jonas, who was on his radio. I said, Mayday, 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 lot of six to command post Mayday. And the Deputy Chief Tom Haring answers, so go ahead, lot of six. This is a lot of six. We are in the North Tower, Tower Number One, in the B stairway, and we're trapped between the second and fourth floor. I get choked up every time I talk about this, but uh, I remember Cliff Stabner uh, in particular uh, getting on the radio and say, we're coming for you, brother. We're coming for you. And uh, they were. The, uh, the army of the New York City Fire Department was coming to get us. Being realistic, I said, well, there's no way they're ever going to find us. There's a hundred stories of debris on top of me. Uh, I just thought that, we, you know, that this was going to be a tomb. I prayed, please, God, make it quick, and it didn't happen. For three hours, the firemen waited in the darkness, and then the smoke and the dust of the collapsed tower began to settle. I'm just laying on my back there and looking up, and all of a sudden I could see a little, uh, like from black, I could see a gray area. And then it's getting a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter, and I called up, I said, you, you know, do you guys see that? What is that? All of a sudden, a beam of sunshine broke through the dust, and it came into the stairway. And it, it almost looked like, like a light from the heavens, literally. And it just hit me. And I says, guys, I see sunshine. 
So they used to be 106 floors above us, and now I see sunshine. This isn't as bad as we thought. I said, we're going to get out of here. And then I said, Jay, you know, I'm climbing up further to the light. And uh, I climb up, and all of a sudden I'm on this pile of debris, but I'm out. You can see the sky. All I could see was devastation. What you would picture a nuclear attack to be like. Just burning buildings and just steel and rubble. They still had to climb out, a dangerous journey that would take hours. You have all this twisted steel and ripped steel, which is all very sharp and jagged. And all of it's coated with this dust, which makes it very slippery. It's almost acting like talcum powder. Every once in a while, I say, come on, boys, keep going, keep going. I says, you don't have to move fast, but you got to keep going. The final obstacle, a three-story deep trench of twisted steel that they must cross. And they were like, oh, we got to climb up the other side of that. I says, yeah, so your wife and kids are on the other side of that trench. Just keep going, keep going. I was able to see all my guys go up over that hill, and I got to, I got to send them home that day. None of the survivors who gave us their time claim they have fully recovered. The past year has been harder than they imagined. It's like my shadow. It's never going to go away. It goes with me every place I go. It's the first thing I think about in the morning. It's the last thing I think about at night. Every time that I've looked at a plane, every time that I've seen an aircraft, I have to watch that plane until it's past and it's gone. Every day is a struggle. I miss laughing the way I used to. As I walk to work every morning, the first thing I do is look at the skyline and see if all the tall buildings are standing. And then not walk by them. I went to war, and I didn't have to. I wasn't trained for it, you know. I wasn't prepared for it. And to be thrown into that, you know. So that's tough to live with every day. The lives of most of the World Trade Center survivors we met have returned to normal, as much as that is possible. Most of them are back at work and pursuing careers that were so horribly interrupted a year ago. After eight operations, Ling Young is still working full-time on her recovery. Mary Jose has had three operations so far, as has Donna Spera, who has never set foot back in New York City. Fred Eichler's insurance business did not survive the destruction of that day, and he's still unemployed. Kelly Ryer is now married. His first child, a baby boy, is due at the end of November. The fire department captain, Jay Jonas, was promoted to battalion chief five days after the Trade Center disaster. Ron DeFrancesco tried to continue working in the shadow of Ground Zero this year, but he has recently moved with his family to Canada. been a tough anniversary. We want to thank all those people who took the time to share their stories with us. It meant a great deal to us. Our coverage will continue. ABC News 9-11 will continue. I pray In time.